All right, folks, so we've just come through a pretty eventful week over at OpenAI, with Sam Altman right in the thick of things. Sam did an interview in which he answered some very, very interesting questions, both about GPT-5 and what is likely to be the future of AI. So watch the entire video, folks, because this will probably be one of the most insightful videos we've covered so far, as it reveals Sam's opinions on GPT-5 and some recent controversies. Now, right off the bat, Sam dropped some intriguing hints. We're talking about possibly, and yes, that's a big possibly, a brand new architecture on the horizon. Imagine a fresh approach to how these AI systems could train more efficiently with what's known as synthetic data. It's all pretty speculative, but the implications? Well, huge. Okay, let's talk a moment about an article from The Information that came out a few months back. Right around the same time, the news broke about Sam Altman's departure from OpenAI. Specifically, this was back in November last year. Now, this piece highlighted a significant breakthrough by Sutskiver that essentially allowed OpenAI to bypass some major hurdles in securing enough high-quality data to train their new models. Keep this in mind, folks, because we're going to need it in just a bit. Now, what I'm going to do next is show you a clip from the interview. In the clip, the interviewer dives into how these new models are being trained and whether it's all about churning out massive volumes of synthetic data. But here's where it gets interesting. Sam Altman lays it all out, revealing the real strategy behind their approach. I think what you need is high quality data. There is low quality synthetic data, there's low quality human data. Um, and as long as we can find enough quality data to train our models or ways, another thing is ways to train, you know, get better at data efficiency and learn more from smaller amounts of data or any number of other techniques uh, were, I think that's okay. And I'd say we feel like we have what we need for this next model. Are you, have you created? And you can see here, he pretty much lays it out saying they've got what's needed for the next model. So whatever techniques they're using to boost data efficiency for this upcoming model, be it synthetic data or just innovatively sourcing more high-quality data, it's all part of the strategy. Interestingly, if we look at the trends specifically, it's clear smaller models are improving significantly. This is a direct result of recognizing just how crucial high-quality data really is. Now, let's keep rolling with the clip. We have what we need for this next model. Are you, have you created massive amounts of synthetic data to train your model on? Have you self-generated data for training? We, we of course have done all sorts of experiments, including generating lots of synthetic data. Um, my hope is that there will be, you know, there, there, there'd be something like very strange if the best way to train a model was to just generate like a quadrillion tokens of synthetic data and feed that back in. It would, you'd say that like somehow that seems inefficient and there ought to be something where you can just learn more from the data as you're training. Uh, and, you know, I think we still have a lot to figure out. But yeah, of course, we've generated um, lots of synthetic data to experiment training on that. But uh, again, I think the real, the core of what you're asking is how can you learn more from less data? That's interesting. I didn't know that. So, yeah, it seems like what OpenAI and Sam Altman isn't exactly spelling out, but what we can piece together from this brief segment is their focus on leveraging whatever data they have, be it synthetic, human-generated, or any other form. I really wanted to bring this up because it's easy to overlook that article I mentioned before, where Satskiyeva's breakthrough was a game-changer, allowing OpenAI to sidestep the huge hurdle of acquiring enough high-quality data to train new models. Now, this was probably around when they started training GPT-5. I guess this was the big challenge in developing next-gen models, involving a shift towards using computer-generated rather than real-world data like text or images from the internet for training. Then I think what's really exciting is the hint Sam Altman dropped about this breakthrough, possibly shaping how they're training these new models. It's thrilling to think about the potential benchmarks for GPT-5 and beyond. Benchmarks that might not just be emergent, but could fundamentally redefine our expectations. Now, here's where things get even more interesting. Sam Altman dives into a topic that's likely a concern. He touches on post-AGI economics. You know, currently our economy is labor-based. You give your time, your effort, your skill, and in return, you get money. 
But as we move toward a future where the type of work you do, whether physical or cognitive, white collar or blue collar, changes drastically over time, it begs the question, how will our society adapt? If the social contract shifts from valuing human labor to something else entirely, what does that mean for how we live and work? This is what Sam Altman discusses, and I think it's a conversation we all need to be tuned into. I still expect, although I don't know what, and this is over a long period of time, this is not a like next year or, you know, the year after that kind of thing, but over a long period of time, I still expect that there will be some change required to the social contract, given how powerful we expect this technology to be. Um, I'm not a believer that there won't be any jobs. I think we always find new things to do. But I do think like the whole structure of society itself will you know, be up for some degree of debate and reconfiguration. And that reconfiguration will be led by the large language model companies? No, no, no. Just the way the whole economy works uh, and what we like what society decides uh, we want to do. And this has been happening for a long time as the world gets gets richer. Um, social safety nets are a great example of this. I expect we will decide we want to do more there. Okay, this is where things start to get really fascinating, folks. We're talking about the concept of UBI, universal basic income, but with a twist that Sam Altman has toyed with, universal basic compute. Imagine this, in a world where an ASI or artificial superintelligence system exists, the game changes entirely. This isn't just about allocating money anymore. It's about distributing something potentially more valuable, possibly compute resources that can do wonders for individuals. Here's the scoop. If AGI becomes a reality, it might mean that everyone gets, say, an hour of superintelligent compute time daily. Now, I know it sounds a bit out there. Trying to wrap our heads around how exactly this would work is tough. We're not just talking about swapping out cash here. This shift would redefine the very fabric of our economy and society. This topic is tricky, folks. I mean, we're talking about a societal framework that's never been attempted before. I think it's super intriguing to think about whether we can actually nail this transition. And guess what? AI might even play a role in shaping how this new society functions, how it's organized, and how we all fit into this bold new world. As you train this next iteration, let's, let's, let's stick with the next iteration of the model. As you train it, what level of improvement do you think we're likely to see? Are we likely to see kind of a linear improvement or are we likely to see asymptotic improvement? Or are we likely to see any kind of exponential, very surprising improvement? Great question. Uh, we don't expect that we're near an asymptote, um, but you know, this is like a debate in the world and I think the best thing for us to do is uh, just show not tell. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people making a lot of predictions and I think what we'll try to do is just do the best research we can um, and then figure out how to responsibly release whatever, uh, whatever we're able to create. I expect that it'll be hugely better in some areas and surprisingly not as much better in others, which has been the case with every previous model. But this feels like the conversation we've had every uh, other model release. You know, when we were going from 3 to 3.5 and 3.5 to 4, there's a lot of debate about, well, is it really going to be that much better? Uh, if so, in what ways? And the answer is there still seems to be a lot of headroom. Um, and I expect that we will make progress on some things that people didn't expect to be possible on the whole. So folks, here's something that really took me by surprise. Turns out there are areas for improvement in AI that we hadn't even considered possible. This is why I'm saying these upcoming models, the next iteration, they might not exactly shatter our current benchmarks. Instead, we might need to totally rethink how we use these systems. And that, my friends, could be the biggest shock. Currently, I guess everyone's focused on standard benchmarks. Think MMLU, GSM 8K, and the like. Sure, these are incredibly useful for quantitatively measuring how the models perform. Then there's the ELO arena, well, that's where you can actually interact with the model and see how it performs in real-world scenarios, not just under lab conditions, which might not fully reflect real-world use. Now, here's the kicker. 
Sam Altman himself has been quoted in previous interviews saying that GPT-4 is very dumb. And that's a bold statement, especially considering how many of us have integrated GPT-4 into our daily routines. But if he's calling that model dumb, it really sets the stage for what's coming next. It makes you wonder about the potential leaps in areas we haven't even thought about, areas we think can't possibly be improved upon. And on another note, Sam Altman recently responded to some serious accusations. If you missed this, Helen Toner, a board member involved in his firing, accused him of outright lying. So he came forward to give his side of the story. In the world of top-tier AI companies, when your name is out there, addressing such claims becomes crucial. Look, I, I respectfully, but very significantly, disagree with uh, her, her recollection of events. But I will say that I think Ms. Toner is... Um, she genuinely cares about a good AGI outcome, and I appreciate that about her. Um, I wish her well. AGI, Ms. Toner is, um, she genuinely cares about a good AGI outcome, and I appreciate that about her. Um, I wish her well. I, yeah, probably don't want to get into like a line-by-line -line refutation here. Um, when we released ChatGPT, uh, we, it was, you know, at the time called a low-key research preview. We did not expect what happened to happen, but we had, of course, talked a lot with our board about a, a kind of research plan that we were, a release plan that we were moving towards. We had, at this point, had, you know, 3.5, which ChatGPT was based on available for, I think, about eight months or something like that. We had a long since finished training GPT-4, and we were figuring out a, a sort of gradual release plan to that. Um, but yeah, like... I, uh, I, I disagree with her, her recollection of events. So I guess it's really important for Sam Altman to at least share his side of the story, especially given the roller coaster week he's had. And trust me, when I say it is one heck of a week, it's saying something considering we've seen our fair share of OpenAI board drama. As they say, what would OpenAI be without a little drama? And speaking of drama, let's not forget the Scarlett Johansson fiasco involving the use of celebrity voices. Another whirlwind of controversy. I won't rehash the entire ordeal since it's pretty well known by now, but Altman did address this issue. I guess it's these kinds of responses that really give us a deeper insight into the ongoing challenges and how they're being handled at the top. Um, let's talk about the Scarlett Johansson episode, because there's something about it I don't understand. So you demonstrate these voices. She then puts out a statement, which gets a lot of attention. Everybody here probably saw it, saying they asked me if I could use my voice. I said no. They came back two days before the product was released. I said no again. They released it anyway. OpenAI then put out a statement saying, not quite right. We had a whole bunch of actors come in and audition. We selected five voices. After that, we asked her whether she would be part of it she would have been the sixth voice. What I don't get about that is that one of the five voices sounds just like Scarlett Johansson. So it sounds almost like you are asking there to be six voices, two of which sound just like her. And I'm curious if you can explain that, that to me. Yeah, it's not her voice. Uh, it's not supposed to be. Uh, I'm sorry for the confusion. Clearly, you think it is uh, voice. Some people's, I mean, people are going to have different opinions about how much voices sound alike, uh, but we don't, it's not her voice. And uh, yeah, we don't think it. Not sure what else to say. All right. Now we have something quite interesting coming up. And while it might not grab everyone's attention, I believe it's crucial. Interpretability research. For those who might not be familiar, this is about diving deep into the AI's process, trying to unpack what exactly goes on in its mind when it makes decisions. And it seems like Sam Altman hinted that OpenAI might have reached some sort of breakthrough. Why do I think this is significant? Well, consider how OpenAI has been behaving. They don't seem overly concerned about the fact that their super alignment team has disbanded. This leads me to believe that before the team was disbanded, there were meaningful efforts going into interpretability research. It appears they might have nailed down most of what they needed to cover this area. You can hear it straight from Sam Altman in this clip where he suggests that they've got most of their bases covered. So perhaps they're further along than we initially thought. I think that safety is going to require like, like a whole package approach 
but this question of interpretability does seem like a useful thing to understand. And there's many levels at which that could work. Uh, we, we certainly have not solved interpretability. There's a number of things going on I'm very excited about, but nothing close to where I would say, yeah, you know, everybody can go home. We, we've got this figured out. Uh, it does seem to me that the more we can understand what's happening in these models, the better. And and I think that can be part of this cohesive package to how how we can make and verify safety claims. But if you don't understand what's happening, isn't that an argument to not keep releasing new, more powerful models? Well, we don't understand what's happening in your brain at a neuron by neuron level. And yet we know you can like follow some rules and we can ask you to explain why you think something. Uh, th there, are, there are other ways to understand a system. Okay, folks, let me know what you think about these interviews. If you found them insightful, if you thought it was good, if you're excited about some of the new things coming with the models, or if you simply can't wait and are just too excited for GPT-5. See you in the next one, folks. You all take care.